Hello and good afternoon. It is July 6th. I uh, hope everybody had a good Independence Day. Hope you still have all your fingers and everything if you were partaking in fireworks, and I hope you all socially distanced. I'm recording today about 90 miles or so, maybe an hour outside of Chicago. I had to go visit my mother, so I'm recording on a laptop. I hope the recording is going to be okay, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, two things we're going to talk about today. One is Africa, and the other is Islam. The uh, first thing you have to know about Africa, and some sometimes people don't understand this, Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent. Africa is a continent that's made up of a bunch of countries, just like North America and Europe are continents made up of a bunch of countries. In fact, there are more countries in Africa than I can personally name. I can name a good handful, but there are quite a few that I miss. And Africa is a lot bigger than you think. I've got here a picture of Africa to kind of show you how big it actually is. And you see the United States, Spain, France, Germany, China, the United Kingdom, all those different places put together make up Africa. It is almost 12 million square miles. You can fit a lot of places in there. And the population of Africa is about 1.2 billion people. So Africa is huge. Now, just in case you forgot, it's thought in anthropological terms that humans originated in Eastern and Southern Africa. Remember, that's the out of Africa theory. Also remember, early humans were called hunter-gatherers. And then you have that agricultural revolution began in Africa about 10,000 years ago. Now, it begins near the Red Sea, which, if you'll see my mouse, is right there. And then it spreads south and it spreads west from there. Now, the primary crops that were grown were millet and sorghum, and eventually bananas, sugarcane, coconuts are going to come to Africa from Southeast Asia. Ancient Egypt was located in Africa, and just a quick refresher there, uh, first Egyptian settlements around 5200 BC along the Nile River, then they spread, and by 3500 BC there are people living the entire length of the Nile River, there were conflicts because of population growth, and then the Egyptian kingdom is going to form around 3000 BC. And there was the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, the New Kingdom, uh, the Egyptian religion with Ra, Amun, all of those, and then hieroglyphics somewhere between 3500 and 3200 BC. So remember, Egypt is part of Africa. But a place we haven't really talked about yet is ancient Ethiopia. And I've got here a picture of where Ethiopia was. Originally, it was the kingdom of Aksum and the kingdom of Kush. And it's located along the Blue Nile. Uh, once again, if you can see my mouse, the Nile River actually splits in what is today modern Sudan. And it becomes what's known as the Blue Nile and the White Nile. Now, not to get too much into the details, the White Nile is longer the Blue Nile is bigger. The Blue Nile is where most of the water comes from. Aksum was originally a colony of the Kingdom of Saba. The Kingdom of Saba was over here in southern Yemen. And if you've ever heard of the Queen of Sheba, the Queen of Sheba was actually the Queen of Saba. Now, the Kingdom of Aksum, or what will become Ethiopia, it was fairly wealthy because it was located near these trade routes. And in the early 300s, Ethiopia converts to Christianity, and for the most part, Ethiopia today is a Christian country. Now, the Sahara, um, first of all, don't say Sahara Desert, because then you're saying desert, desert, and that just sounds weird. The Sahara, it's one of the most prominent features of Africa, and it is still growing larger today. Somewhere between 5,000 and 6,000 BC, there was a climate shift, a climate change, and Africa began drying out. The official term for that is desiccation. And these trade routes develop all through the Sahara, and that's what these, uh, these red dotted lines are. And one of the biggest routes went from the coast where Benin is, down at the southern part of the map, all the way up through Timbuktu, and then over to Carthage. That was a very heavily traveled route, and the city of Carthage becomes this focal point for Trans-Saharan trade, and that's what made the city of Carthage so important during Roman times. 
Uh, Eastern and Southern Africa. Um, people don't talk about this part of Africa a lot, but it's really fascinating. When I was getting my master's, I took a class on Central Africa, and I was just blown away with how much there was to learn. First thing, uh, the people of Southern and Africa are known as the Bantu. Bantu literally means people. And there are over 450 different Bantu languages. Um, they're somewhat understandable. Uh, think of it like different dialects or some of the words are different. If you are a person who speaks Spanish, you can kind of sort of speak Italian too. You can understand what they're saying to a certain point, but it's obviously a different language. That's kind of what this Bantu was like. And today there are over 350 million people who speak Bantu. And their language has this idea of reduplication. Um, the best example I can think of is the word piga, P-I-G-A. Piga means to hit or to strike. And piga, piga means to strike repeatedly. A second language that's important in Southern Africa is Khoisan. Uh, this is known as the click language. And in the, the PowerPoint, I've got a video here, and I don't know if this will play or not. I'll try it real quick. You are all here to come and learn this clicks. So if you listen to that, I don't know if it's going to show up in this recording, but if you press play on that YouTube video, you're going to hear these this language that has clicks in it. And the click actually means something, depending where the click is in the language and how the click is presented, means different things. And there are about 500 million people who speak this Khoisan language. Both Eastern and Southern Africa, they're going to trade with India, and they're going to trade with the Middle East as well. And there's a lot of similarities, a lot of connection between those groups of people. Africa is also important to ancient Greece. Uh, Africa and Greece are linked very, very early on. In fact, Africa is the site of many of the ancient Greek stories. Uh, there's the Pillars of Heracles, uh, there's the Rock of Gibraltar, and the Mountain of Yabel Musa. Um, the Gibraltar is right at the southern tip of Spain. Yabel Musa is at the northern tip of Morocco. That's supposed to be where Heracles stood and pushed the world apart. Then there's the Cave of Heracles, which are in, in uh, Morocco, which is supposedly where Heracles slept before he fought the Titan Atlas. And then there's also the famous story of Andromeda. Uh, the thought, let me see. The story of Andromeda is basically, Andromeda was supposed to be beautiful. Her mom, Cassiopeia, was proud of her beauty. And Cassiopeia even said that her daughter Andromeda was more beautiful than all the daughters of Poseidon. And it made Poseidon very angry. And Poseidon sent a sea monster to try and kill Andromeda. And Andromeda is going to be saved by Perseus, and Perseus and Andromeda are going to fall in love. And it was a, basically, the story of Andromeda is a story that was told to Greek children. And it was all based about Andromeda, who was from Africa. Now, in the Hellenistic world, meaning the world of Alexander the Great, remember the city of Alexandria, which is in Egypt, becomes the center of Greek culture. And after the death of Alexander, Ptolemy is going to steal Alexander's body, hide it in Egypt, and Alexandria is going to become the capital of the Greek world. Now, the Greeks are going to adopt the language of the Phoenicians, meaning the early Carthaginians, the... Greeks are going to fall in love with Egypt, and Africa is going to capture the hearts and the minds of Greece, if you will. When you get to the Roman Empire, it's even more important. you got to think of those Punic Wars, where Rome and Carthage, they're mortal enemies, and Rome and Carthage fights, they fight three different times. Once Rome takes over northern Africa, 
those North African provinces were considered part of the city of Rome. So they're not just provinces, they are considered part of the homeland. And North Africa is going to be where the city of Rome gets all of its food and all of its grain. Christianity, I know I haven't talked about it yet, that's going to be with the Middle Ages, but it is very important to North Africa. Uh, so Christianity is going to spread throughout North Africa very shortly after the, the beginning of the Christian religion. It's going to be spread through North Africa by the Apostle Mark. Uh, Christianity is going to become established in both Egypt and Ethiopia, but it's a form of Christianity called Coptic Christian. Coptic Christianity does exist. It's, it's a small subset of Christianity. But um, if you're a Coptic Christian, generally what you believe is that Jesus was human, and then after Jesus died, then he became a divine figure. Most Christian denominations believe that Jesus was both human and divine at the same time. So if you're a Coptic Christian, another way to think of it is that Jesus had two different lives. One was his completely human life. He dies, he's resurrected, and then he has a godlike life after that. One of the most important figures in early Christianity came from northern Africa, and that was a gentleman named Augustine of Hippo. Augustine of Hippo, he argues that non-Christians were to blame for an attack on Rome when everybody else was blaming Christians and killing and persecuting Christians. Augustine of Hippo is going to say, no, it was not Christians who caused the attack on Rome. It was somebody else who had no say over it. Foundations of Islam. Um, before I tell you a little about Islam, got to do your secret word of the day. And today's secret word is the word rebel, R-E-B-E-L. Why is it rebel? Because we just had the 4th of July and the colonists were rebels against the English. So word of the day, your secret word is rebel, R-E-B-E-L. Okay, so moving on from the secret word, let's talk about Islam for a moment. Islam, you probably know this, was founded in the city of Mecca, but well, a lot of people don't know is why it was Mecca. Well, at the time, Mecca was kind of this crossroads of caravan routes, or trade routes, if you will. There were caravan routes that traded, or connected Palestine, which was the Holy Land, with Syria, and then there were some other ones that connected Yemen to Ethiopia and Eastern Africa. It was this big place where a bunch of traders, a bunch of people just came together. Mecca, there was very little manufacturing, very little agriculture. Its primary source of money was tourism. And because there were so many different people who came to Mecca and passed through the city, there were over 350 different gods that were represented and worshipped there. So that's the why Mecca. That's because it was a very, very religious city. Now the who, you probably know it was Muhammad, but who was Muhammad? Well, here's what we know. We know Muhammad was born in the year 570. We know he was raised in the city of Mecca. Uh, we know that he was orphaned at a young age. He married a wealthy woman at the age of 25. And then in the year 610 AD, he goes to a cave at a place called Mount Hira. And according to tradition, the Archangel Gabriel visits him. And the Archangel Gabriel says, Muhammad, I got a job for you. And according to tradition, Gabriel is going to reveal the words of Yahweh who is now going to be known as Allah, and ask Muhammad to go and spread the message of Yahweh. Now notice, there is a very, very close similarity between Yahweh and Allah, and in Christianity, the technical word for, for God is Jehovah. That's because Islam is not a new religion. It is another take on Judaism, just like Christianity is another take on Judaism. So when you get down to it, there's not a lot of things that are surprising. Like, there are five pillars of Islam. There's Shahada, which means one God. That's just like in Judaism. In Judaism, there is Yahweh. There is nothing else. 
In Islam, there is Allah, there's nothing else. And in some forms of Christianity, there is no trinity. There is only one God. A salat is prayer. A good Jew is supposed to pray every day. A good Christian is supposed to pray today. A good Muslim or follower of Islam is supposed to pray every day. The biggest difference is in Islam, the person is supposed to pray five times a day. There is zakat, which is tithing. There is tithing in Judaism. There is tithing in Christianity. If you are somebody who goes to a Christian church, you know that during some part of the church service, the organ gets all pretty. These people get up and they start passing plates throughout the audience. That is tithing. You're supposed to give a certain percentage of your earnings to the church. In Islam, instead of being voluntarily, it's expected. And it's thought that the tithing, the volunteering of your money, your wealth, it's a loan that will be repaid in the afterlife. You've got the psalm, which is fasting, and you've got that in Christianity with Lent, where you have to give things up. You have that in Judaism with Passover, where you're supposed to give something up. Islam has psalm. Now, the most famous part of the fasting in Islam is Ramadan and Ramadan you're not supposed to eat or drink from sun up to sundown no pleasures of the flesh if you will no no hanky panky and you're not supposed to take any medicine unless it's for life saving or life preserving purposes then last but not least there is Hajj or pilgrimage every good Muslim is expected to go to Mecca at least once in their life now you might think that's weird. You might say, well, there's nothing like that in Christianity. There used to be. It used to be in Christianity, you were expected to go to Rome and Jerusalem once in your life. If you are uh, a Jew, if you're a believer in Judaism, you're supposed to go to Jerusalem once in your life. In Islam, you were supposed to go to Mecca and Jerusalem once in your life. Now I always like to point this out. Notice Jihad, Holy War, it's not part of Islam. There are people who took Islam and corrupted it for their own means, and that's where Muslims tend to get a bad name in the Western world today because of those bad apples, if you will. But jihad, not part of Islam. Islam is supposed to be a peaceful faith just like Christianity and Judaism are. Now there are two important books in Islam. There's the Quran, that means the recitation, and that's supposed to be the words of God as revealed to Muhammad. It takes 114 chapters, it's based on the Torah, and in the Quran it says both the Torah and the Holy Bible are divine books from God. There's also the Hadith, and that's supposed to contain a record of everything Muhammad said and everything Muhammad did. It says the Quran, and the hadith. Now you also have the hijra, and this is where people start to get things confused between peace and not peace, jihad and not jihad. In 622, Muhammad was forcibly moved to a city called Medina. It's about 200 miles north of Mecca, and this re relocation it wasn't voluntary. Because Muhammad was proclaiming a new religion, because there were 360 other gods being worshipped in that city. He was kind of pushed out. Muhammad, he gathers followers in Medina until about 630, and in 630 he starts to attack caravans headed towards Mecca. And then when Muhammad finally does get to Mecca, he conquers Mecca. And that's where people get this whole thing about jihad mixed up with the religion itself. Now what happens after Muhammad? Muhammad dies in 632. Abu Bakr is chosen to be his next leader. And Abu Bakr, he becomes a leader of the religion. He becomes the commander of the army Muhammad left. He becomes the leader of the country or the kingdom Muhammad founded. And he becomes the supreme judge for Muslims. By 634, Abu Bakr has united most of the Arab people under the religion of Islam, and then Bakar, he starts to send armies to surrounding areas, not for religion, but for the 
religious kingdom he fought, he founded. I hope that makes sense. They weren't conquering in the name of religion. They were conquering in the name of the kingdom that just happened to be a religious kingdom. So I want to make sure you can keep the two things separate. There are three branches of Islam today. There's Shiites, there's Sunnis, and there's Sufis. The Shiites, they believe that Ali, who is Muhammad's son-in-law, was supposed to be the true successor of Muhammad. And Shiites, they believe that Muhammad was a prophet. And then Shiites also believe that the written laws and the written beliefs that are in the Quran are the only accepted beliefs. They're basically by the book. Sunnis, they say Abu Bakr was the true successor. And they look at the big picture. Sunnis look at the traditions. And Sunnis look at the actions of Muhammad. As well as what's written in the Quran. So they take the big picture view. And Sunnis for most of history were the, the predominant belief until very recent times. So Shiites are very by the book. They're very strict. Sunnis are kind of big picture. Well, what did Muhammad do and what did Muhammad say? And then third but not least, you've got Sufis. They said that the divine attributes of Allah were manifest in Muhammad. So Muhammad was a manifestation of God. They said Muhammad was a supreme being and that you can know Allah by knowing Muhammad. So they're kind of like this mystical alternative to Shiites and Sunnis. Now, if that's not enough, there's this Islamic civilization that is founded. Uh, Islamic society, you've got cities that are huge. The city of Baghdad has over a million residents, and that's in modern-day Iraq. There's also a city named Cordoba, which is in modern-day Spain. It had a, a population of 400,000, which was one of the largest cities in Europe. The city of Cordoba had a mosque or a Islamic church that sat over 5,000 people. And the city of Cordoba had uh, 900 bathhouses, 1,500 mosques, like 100,000 shops, and their library was one of the largest libraries in the world. This Islamic civilization, it's going to develop this vast trading network that stretches all the way from Europe to China. Islamic culture is going to initially be very religiously tolerant to both Christians and Jews. They were both seen as people of the faith. The only thing was, Christians and Jews had to follow Islamic law. But if you're a, quote, heathen, you're forcibly volunteered to become Muslim. Women are excluded society. Uh, but men are allowed to have up to four wives. The only catch is you have to be able to support all four of your wives. And Islam is going to be one of the places we get our modern medicine, our modern science, and our modern philosophy from. Because uh, Muslims are going to preserve a lot of ancient knowledge in libraries. Alright, so that's your whirlwind tour of Africa and Islam. And I want to real quick show you what's going on in our class. And I'm just going to pick one of these world histories because I've set them up so the schedule is the same for whichever class you're in. And I just want you to realize where we are. We are right here on 7-6 this week. So we really only have this week and next week of instruction left. Summer's almost over, my friends. It goes really, really quick. Why is that important? It's because you have two weeks to do your research paper. And I'm going to put up another video here in a moment that kind of goes over the research paper in more detail. Um, but I wanted it to be a separate video for you guys just so you can focus on that. So next week, you got your fourth and final reflection paper that's going to be due. You've got your, your research paper that's due. And don't forget that museum review that's going to be due the very last day of class on March 20th. Not March. Why did I say March? Wow. July 26th. I promise I know what, what month it is. But on July 26th, that's when your museum review is due. And don't forget, you can watch either a movie, when some of those movies in that, in that list are really, really good, or you can look at one of those virtual museums. 
So just wanted to make sure you knew we're almost done. All right, until next time, we'll see you later. Have a good Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Bye-bye.